everyone. Uh, I'm glad to kickstart our journal club today. Uh, my name is Alessandro Villar. I'm a PRL editor. I handle papers mostly in quantum thermodynamics, quantum antibody physics, uh, and optical atomic molecular physics. Stoyan Rebic, one of my colleagues in PRL, but also an editor in our newest journal, PRX Quantum, uh, is also here today. The journal club is an initiative of the Physical Review Journals, the not-for-profit journals of the American Physical Society. Uh, the idea of the Journal Club, now in its third edition, is to promote excellent research published in the Physical Review and to offer a virtual forum of discussion focused on early career researchers. So I refer you to the Journal Club website uh, at the bottom uh, left of the slide that you can see uh, to access recordings of previous talks and also to check the schedule of future talks. Uh, but don't bother noting that down. If you Google Physical Review Journal Club, you'll get to the right place. Uh, we intend to hold this at least once per month, and please tell your colleagues about this. Uh, the first, the first uh, talks of the Journal Club are focused in quantum technologies, uh, because the Physical Review has just started a new journal focused on quantum information and quantum technology, PRX Quantum. This is intended as a selective journal to be a new high-profile home for this community in the Physical Review. Uh, for more information, just check the website. And uh, before we start, just a quick uh, 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 tour of Zoom, if you, like me, stumble sometimes. Uh, so let me just give you a brief overview of the features that you might want to use during the talk. So after the talk, the speaker, Amy Hughes, and her co-authors, they will be answering questions. Uh, if you have questions during the talk, please type them in the chat box that you see at the bottom of the main Zoom window. Uh, and our moderator, Professor Holm, We'll be organizing them for after the talk. If you have questions after the talk, you may also raise your hand by clicking the button participants uh, that you see at the bottom of your Zoom screen uh, and clicking raise hand at the bottom of the little box that opens. Uh, I also ask you to please mute yourselves uh, as default to avoid interference from background noise during the talk. Uh, okay, without further delay, uh, let's start off talk today. Uh, the paper we'll, we'll, we'll be presenting uh, has been published recently in PRL by the Iron Trap Quantum Computing Group in the Center for Quantum Computation of the Clarendon Laboratory. Uh, our speaker is Amy Hughes, the first author of the paper, and the moderator is Jonathan Holm, professor of, uh, at ETH in Switzerland. Uh, let me stop with the screen sharing. So let me first introduce uh, uh, Professor Holm uh, and he will then take over the meeting. So Professor Holm is a well-known principal investigator in the area of quantum computing. I think you, Amy, you can already start sharing your slide. I will soon give it to Professor Holm. Uh, and he's a well-known principal investigator in the area of quantum computing. Uh, he's done his PhD in Oxford with Andrew Steen and postdoc in NIST in David Weinland's group he started his own research group in Zurich in 2010. Uh, and his research focus now, he told me, is uh, in performing quantum error correction, both in mixed species setups and by encoding logical qubits in a quantum harmonic oscillator, as first proposed by Gottesman, Kitayev, and Presco. Please, Jonathan, uh, welcome, and the meeting is now yours. OK, thanks very much, uh, Alessandro. So um, it's a pleasure to be here to uh, introduce uh, this talk today. Sorry, I'm going to just pull off my screen. Uh, so um, it's a pleasure to be here to introduce this session. So um, uh, thanks for all who are attending and thanks in particular for a set of uh, authors uh, who've come here to present their paper, which I'm looking forward to the presentation. So I just uh, first list the author list. I think so we have here with us today, Amy Hughes, Vera Schaefer, David Nadlinger, David Lucas and Chris Balance from the Oxford Iron Trap Group. We're missing two of the co-authors, which is Keshav Thirumalai and Sarah Woodrow. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a pleasure to have the current authors with us. So the primary author on this paper is Amy Hughes. Uh, Amy's a fourth year PhD student uh, at Oxford, uh, and she was also at Oxford for her undergraduate studies. So with that, then I take leave of the stage. Amy's going to present the paper. And so I hand over to Amy to uh, give us an introduction to this uh, paper on benchmarking a high fidelity mixed species entangling gig. Yeah, uh, thanks very much for the introduction, Jonathan. Um, 
Yeah, my name's Amy Hughes. I am a PhD student at Oxford. I'm actually just finishing up my um, PhD at the moment, so I'm in the process of writing my thesis. It's a very nice distraction to be talking to you today instead. Uh, so thanks very much to the organisers for inviting us. Um, and as Jonathan said, the people who are underlined on this slide are the co-authors who will be available after my presentation for Q&A. So I'd like to present the main results of our recently published PRL paper, which is entitled Benchmarking a High Fidelity Mixed Species Entangling Gate. Uh, the way I'd like to do this is by breaking down the title into four main phrases um, and actually by adding another phrase which is important but which is not in the title and that's trapped ions. So in our group we trap ions for quantum computing applications. So I will talk a bit about um, a bit of an introduction to how that works. In this paper, we actually work with two different atomic elements, calcium 43 and strontium 88. And we generate entanglement between the internal states of these two ions. So I'll talk a bit about why we want to do that uh, and how this entangling process or gate works. Finally, we measure the fidelity of our entanglement process. So fidelity is essentially a measure of how well it works. The closer to 100%, the better. And I won't spoil the end of the talk for you just yet, but we measure the fidelity using three different benchmarking techniques. So firstly, uh, here's a picture of an ion trap. This is actually the trap that we used for the experiment in this paper. And if you zoom into the center here, you can see a strontium ion sitting in the center of the trap. This is a linear pole trap. So here's a schematic of the trap. It essentially consists of six electrodes shown here in red, blue, and yellow, to which we apply voltages in order to trap charged particles in a three-dimensional harmonic potential. In this experiment, we work with two ions in the trap. And since the ions are charged, they interact with each other via the Coulomb interaction, which means they share quantized harmonic oscillator emotional states just like two masses on a spring. So, so for each of the X, Y, and Z directions in the trap, there are two normal modes of motion for two ions. There's a center of mass type mode where the ions move in phase with each other. And there's a breathing or stretch mode where the ions motion is out of phase. As well as sharing a motional state with the other ions in the trap, each ion also has its own internal or electronic quantum state. This is how we use an ion as a qubit or a quantum bit. So we select two of these internal states and use them as our qubit states. We call them generally up and down or one and zero. And in calcium 43, which is one of the ions that we use, we can drive transitions between these two qubits using these two qubit states using microwave radiation. Of course, this isn't quite the full story because the real atomic level structure of calcium 43 has a few more different levels. Uh, so we can couple our qubit states to these other internal states using lasers, which is necessary for things like preparing or reading out a particular qubit state or cooling the ion. This is the structure of strontium 88, which you can see is quite similar to calcium 43. This is the other ion that we use. And the qubit states are again down here in this ground level, but the qubit frequency here is a bit smaller. So why do we want to work with two different elements? Well, the main point here is that different ions have different properties, such as mass or atomic structure, which makes them differently suited for different types of tasks. If you work with two different species, you have the flexibility to choose which ion you want to use, depending on the task you have at hand in your experiment. And this is the case not only in the field of quantum computing, it's also useful for other fields. For example, if you wanted to do spectroscopy of a complex molecular ion or an ion which might be a good atomic clock candidate, those ions might not have an easily accessible cycling transition which you can use for cooling them and reading out their state. But if you co-trap the ion you're interested in with a second ion that you do know how to cool and read out, because of the fact that the ions in the trap share emotional state, 
Cooling this second ion will sympathetically cool the first one. You can also think about transferring information from the first ion to the second one in order to read out the state and do your um, spectroscopy. This is known as quantum logic spectroscopy. And this was first done 15 years ago. So working with two different species is not necessarily a new idea. We're coming at this from the direction of quantum computing with trapped ions. Um, so one of the challenges in our field at the moment is scaling up our systems from individual traps with relatively small numbers of ions in them to larger systems with larger numbers of qubits. There are two main approaches that are being used at the moment in order to do this. The first is to divide your trap into lots of smaller trapping zones. Um, so segment your trap electrodes and you have a small number of ions in each different trapping zone and use your trap electrodes to shuttle the ions between different zones depending on what you want to do. This is known as the, um, usually known as the quantum CCD architecture. The other approach and the one that we're following in Oxford is to link together lots of separate ion traps, each with a small number of ions in them, using optical fibers. So um, it turns out that in this sort of modular networked approach, strontium-88 has properties which make it very good for the communication aspect. So for coupling with the photons to be used in this photonic link. Uh, if you want to know more about this, you can check out this paper that was published from our group this year, which demonstrates remote entanglement between two strontium ions in two separate traps over a photonic link. Unfortunately, the properties that make strontium-88 good for this communication task also mean it's not necessarily the best for storing and processing quantum information. It turns out we want to use calcium-43 for those things instead. It's much better suited. But in order for this model to work, we need a way to transfer quantum information from a strontium to a calcium ion, so to coherently transfer information between these internal states. In other words, we need a mixed species entangling gate. So the goal of a two qubit gate in ions is to couple the internal states of two different ions. But these internal states only interact very weakly. So what we do is we use the fact that in a trap, the ions have the shared motional state. The general principle behind a two qubit gate in ions, whether it's mixed species or same species, is to first couple the ions internal states to their shared motion in order to mediate an interaction between the two. If we want to drive motion, then we need a force. And in order to form a gate, this force has to depend on the ions internal states. And there's a couple of ways to do this. The method that we're using is called a light shift gate. And the idea is this. A laser with a frequency close to an atomic transition frequency can couple two different atomic levels and can shift their energies. This is known as the light shift or the AC Stark shift. And we can use this effect in, for example, our calcium ion. It's slightly more complicated here because it's actually a two photon effect, but the idea is the same, that we turn on this laser and this can induce a shift in the energy of each of our two qubit states. And in general, the shift on one state will be different from the shift on the other. If we have two beams of similar frequencies propagating in opposite directions, we form a standing wave, which our ions can sit in. The intensity of the standing wave varies spatially, and therefore the light shifts on each of the two qubit states also vary spatially. What this means is that for an ion sitting in this standing wave, its energy depends not only on where it is in the wave, but also on which qubit state that ion is in. A spatially varying potential energy means we have a force. Therefore, we've generated a force on our ions which depends on their internal states. It turns out we can use this state-dependent force to excite one of the emotional modes of the trap. So we temporarily excite and then de-excite actually this out-of-phase mode of motion if and only if the ions started in opposite internal states. If the ions start with the same internal state here and here, 
then we don't drive any motion. If they start with opposite states, we temporarily excite this motional mode. And the result of this is that these two states acquire a geometric phase. The size of this geometric phase is proportional to the uh, area enclosed by their trajectory in motional phase space. So for these two states where we don't drive a loop in phase space, they don't acquire any phase. This entangling process is actually equivalent to a C naught gate. So this gate plus single qubit rotations forms a universal gate set for quantum computing. So I haven't said anything yet, which is specific to doing this phase gate with mixed species. And here's where things get slightly more complicated. So the first thing you might think of is if you want to do this gate on two different species, then the laser wavelength that you need has to be close to an atomic transition wavelength. But in general, if you have two different species, they're going to have different transition wavelengths. So in general, you're going to need two different laser wavelengths, one for each ion species. Another thing that happens when we work with mixed species is that uh, some asymmetries come into play that we don't have with same species. So one example is for two ions with different masses, the eigenvectors of their motional modes are asymmetric. So one ion moves with a much bigger amplitude than the other. The effect of these asymmetries is actually that we drive loops in phase space for all four possible starting internal states. So these states where the ions started in the same internal state also acquire some phase. This in itself is not necessarily a problem because the amount of area that's common to all four states essentially translates into a global phase on your final state, which we don't care about. However, what it does do is it makes your gate less efficient. And what I mean by that is in this case, the area that we care about here is the extra area in the green and blue loops compared to in the black loops. So in order to get the same effective extra area in a mixed species gate, we need to drive larger loops in phase space. For example, by using higher laser power. That's what I mean by the gate being less efficient. And the result of this is that mixed species gates are more susceptible to types of errors that we see in same species gates, for example, photon scattering errors. So the extra technical complications involved in doing a mixed species gate mean that previous mixed species gates have performed less well than same species gates. So on this slide, I have a plot of decreasing gate error or increasing gate fidelity on the y-axis. And I've shown some recent gates that have been done in ions. These two blue points here are the best same species gate fidelities that have been measured, and these are about 99.9%. The others are mixed species gates, and I will add that the way that the fidelities are measured in each of these points might not be exactly directly comparable with each other, but the point I want to get across is that generally these mixed species gates perform less well than same species and have struggled to get over this 99% threshold, which we often think of as necessary in order to do quantum error correction. This point here is actually a previous demonstration by our group of the gate mechanism that we're using in this paper, which was first demonstrated on two different isotopes of calcium. So not actually two different elements, but this was the first test and um, it performed pretty well. So this was part of the motivation of trying to use this gate to drive two different elements. And you can see that the fidelity we reached is down here in this corner. So we're now pushing mixed species gate fidelities closer to be competitive with same species fidelities and we're above this 99% threshold. This point here is 99.8%. So what's different about our gate? The thing that's different is really the combination of two different things, which is the elements we use and the mechanism that we use. So using calcium and strontium is very nice because they have these two transitions, one at 408 and one at 397 nanometers. And these transitions are actually close enough together that you can drive both of them using a single wavelength between the two. The second point is that in this light shift gate, 
The frequency difference between the two beams needed to form this standing wave for your state dependent force depends only on the transition frequency and on the motional mode frequency. It's independent of the qubit frequencies of calcium and strontium, which is good because as you can see, these are quite different. What this means is we can drive a gate on both species of ion using a standing wave generated from a single laser. This reduces the technical complexity of our experiment and the number of calibration steps and allows us to push the fidelity that bit further. So how have we measured the fidelity? I said we use three different methods. The first method is partial state tomography. The basic idea here is that we prepare the ions in a known input state we use the gate to produce a bell state, and then we measure and see if we ended up in the correct bell state. You can estimate the fidelity of the gate by looking at the probabilities that the ions end in each of these four possible um, internal state eigenstates, combined with the parity of the bell state that you generate, which you can measure by scanning the phase of this pi by two pulse here. So using this method, we measure a fidelity of 99.8%. There are some known errors here, which are associated with state preparation and measurement, or SPAM, which you can see here. Uh, so this fidelity number here is corrected for the known errors that occur in the process. There are some disadvantages of partial state tomography. Firstly, you might notice that the gate error we're trying to measure here is actually of a similar size to the SPAM errors that we have. This means that we need to take quite a lot of data in order to reduce the statistical uncertainty on this number. The second thing is that we always prepare the same input state. This is not necessarily representative of how you would be using your gate, for example, in a quantum algorithm, where in general, you would have lots of different possible input states as your gate would be used in a long sequence of different operations. So a method of measuring fidelity which gets around those two problems is interleaved randomized benchmarking. There are two main ideas here. The first one is just that rather than doing your gate only once, you do it many times. That means that the total error you measure at the end is much larger than your state preparation and measurement errors. So the amount of data that you need to take in order to reach a similar statistical uncertainty is much lower. The second idea is that before each time you do your light shift gate, you do a random two qubit operation, which is denoted by these C's here. The effect of this is that you measure your average gate fidelity over a range of possible input states and in the more computationally relevant, perhaps, context of a longer sequence of gates. You can estimate the fidelity of a single light shift gate here by looking at how well you can do a sequence like this, compared with how well you can do the same sequence without your extra light shift gates in. So by looking at the difference between these two curves, we can extract the fidelity of one of our light shift gates here as 99.6%. The third and final method we use to benchmark our gate fidelity is gate set tomography. I won't talk too much about this um, at the moment, but it's similar to randomized benchmarking in that it uses a longer sequence of gates. Um, the advantage of gate set tomography is that it tells you not only about the size of your error, but can also give you some information about the type of error that you're encountering. Using gate set tomography, we measure a fidelity of 99.4%. So in summary, a high fidelity mixed species gate gives you the flexibility to choose which ion you want to use in your trap, depending on exactly what task you have at hand in your experiment. We've performed a mixed species gate and benchmarked the fidelity using three different methods. And the fidelity we've managed to reach is now comparable to the best same species gates and is above this 99% threshold. And we're doing this as part of our work towards a networked ion trap quantum computer. Thank you very much for listening, um, especially those of you who are in less friendly time zones. I think it's quite early for some of you. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge our funding and the other members of the Ion Trap group.
uh, in particular David, Chris, Vera, Kesha and David who contributed to this work. And I'll just leave you with this slide which has some more nitty gritty details about our gate for those of you who might be interested in that. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Amy, for this nice and clear uh, presentation. So I'd like to invite the audience then to uh, type questions into the chat, uh, or indeed to raise hands if you have a particular question you'd like to bring orally, and then maybe uh, Stoyan would then enter you. Uh, if I will try and invite you to ask your question, and Stoyan will let you speak at that point. So um, if you can do that, probably using the chat is easier to manage. So maybe in the meantime, uh, I take advantage to start things off. Uh, it's one of the things I'd seen when I was looking at this paper uh, was exactly this trace that you're showing us uh, with this time dynamics. And I think you have good control of your system. Clearly you get good fidelities, but then uh, there are these discrepancies in this sort of up, down and down up data between your theory curves and your uh, experiment, which sort of indicate that maybe you're going further in phase space uh, for some of those points than in uh, than you might think, but maybe you can comment on that yourself. Yeah, um, yeah so this discrepancy between where the points here are and where the theory is. Yeah. Um, I mean, it may be just a case of um, not knowing precisely enough what the gate detuning is or not knowing precisely what the parameters are in the gate. Um, I suppose in terms of where we are in phase space, there are some errors associated with whether or not we were cooled precisely to the ground state, which of course we won't be exactly in n equals zero to start off with. Um, mm -hmm. And that might account for some of the difference here. Um, maybe any other authors want to comment on that? Um, so at those points in the gate dynamics, um, we're like the furthest out in motional phase space, so we're the most susceptible to our errors. Mm -hmm. um, we actually perform um, first order watch modulation. So around the time where we measure the fidelity, where our gate is complete, um, we are much more in, um, in, in motional phase mm -hmm. space and therefore much less susceptible to those errors. Um, we have consistently um, in all gate dynamics seen like slight deviations, especially as we go to the top bits of those gate dynamics, um, but they seem to not have affected the gate fidelity at the gate time in itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so I guess you, you do tweak up at the two times the gate time or one? Yeah, I guess you tweak up on the two rotations or maybe you can go. Yeah. Um, so just, yeah, just yeah, the more yeah. I answer to that, um, I just want to make one more point about these deviations. The other thing they depend on a little is the relative phases of the two gate pulses, which is something that contains a few bits of light shifts and it's slightly difficult to calibrate. So we know that if we're not correcting that perfectly, we do see these deviations in the gate dynamics, mm -hmm. since the, the two different force periods of the gate don't quite align. And with the two species where you have these asymmetries and you're flipping the spins, these give rise to the asymmetry in complex dynamics. And we know that the better we correct for those, the better the dynamic looks. And we don't normally worry too much about that, since once you go anywhere near the loops being closed, the watch modulation completely makes you desensitive to that. Since you're closing the loops in both the both the first and second half of the gate. Yeah. So to answer your second question, um, when we're sort of tweaking up the gate parameters, we use this. Uh, the, the gate dynamics look like this, so we're not using a Walsh modulation, and we actually do not just one loop but two loops. Um, so we try to make sure that this point here is, you know, as good as we can get it. But when we actually use the gate in our, um, when we're measuring the fidelity or in a randomized benchmarking sequence, we um, use Walsh modulation, which means the second loop as the starting phase is 180 degrees flipped compared to the starting phase of the first loop. This means that um, these P10, P01 populations are actually essentially flat. So we're a lot less sensitive to any errors in this area. Mm -hmm. Good, so I'm reading from the chat one question. So Caroline Laura has a question. That, how do you avoid collisions between the two atoms in your trap? Uh, well, so the ions are separated by about two microns uh, and the amplitude of the motion we're exciting here is much smaller than that. So just as a result of how strong the couple is, how strong the coupling is between 
your ions, the motion of your ions and the beam you're using to drive them, it'd be quite difficult to drive them so hard that they hit each other. <laughs> okay, Alessandro has a question. So your group has now demonstrated high fidelity entangling gates and remote entanglement between two traps. Uh, how far are you in the quest for scalability? Yeah, so what's next? Uh, so maybe I'll pass that to someone who worked on the remote entanglement experiment. <laughs> David. Yeah, so uh, yeah, perhaps okay. I, I, can, I can give some perspectives on that. Yeah. So we've demonstrated the primitives now of remote entanglement between different elements and the elements that we need to swap entanglement between the different species, which is necessary to be able to do anything useful with these. So I think the next big milestone along the way is being able to show that not just you can distribute network, uh, distribute information between these two traps, but that uh, you can distribute and use information between the two traps. So you can take two separate uh, quantum computers and you can network them together and make an enhanced state space. Uh, so this both requires having the network connection good, which we've demonstrated, but probably more than this, we probably want to enhance the quality of the network connections to take two or three of these noisy uh, entangled pairs created by the network and then distill into a higher fidelity. So if we can do this, we can distill this entanglement and then we can use this in algorithms where the qubits are physically split over separate traps. We'll have shown that we can network onto the computer. And this will be a really important milestone since when we hit this, we can uh, have, essentially have a recipe of building quantum computers as large as we want to, just by putting more and more of these individual modules with say, you know, five to 10 qubits in together to make larger scale devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess, I guess Alessandro, sort of pulling out to an even, even uh, uh, further away view than the, the quest for scalability. All these sort of experiments are, are, are milestones on the way to scalability, you know, up to and including uh, Google's uh, demonstration of so-called quantum supremacy and so on. But um, real scalability, of course, as everyone appreciates, is a, is a huge uh, technical and engineering challenge, but will probably involve new physics ideas as well. Um, and that uh, certainly we need these sort of techniques. And as, as Chris was saying, a key thing, if you're going to link together different modules optically like this, is this idea of entanglement purification or distillation. Um, because otherwise, these, these beautifully high fidelities we can get inside a single device or module or ion trap um, can't be extended um, between different modules. And that would be a, a, a real a roadblock at some point uh, in the future. So. Good. I have another question on my list, so let me go to, uh, so Chi Zhang uh, is asking on slide seven, you mentioned that all four spin configurations evolve in phase space, and the phase picked up by up, up, and down, down can be factored out as a global phase. Uh, uh, in a more complicated algorithm, when you need to do multiple phase gates, this would this global phase start to matter, or am I, is he misunderstanding the situation? Uh, Vera, do you want to take this one? Um, yeah, so the global phase doesn't matter also in multiple algorithms. Um, for example, in we do randomized benchmarking and gate set tomography where you do many gates in a row. Um, what would matter is if you had um, if you had a single qubit phase accumulated at the end of the gate, which if you just did partial um, state tomography, you could compensate by adjusting the phase um, of your parity fringes. But this is really a global phase, so it's not a quantum, like it's not a measurable quantity, so it's irrelevant. Yes, yeah, so to add to that, once you start doing this in a larger computational uh, system where these two qubits are just a small part of your computational subspace, it then does matter. But all of these are corrected with single qubit phase states, which in practice end up being free since they just evolve, uh, cause you to correct your phase gates uh, later on in the system and essentially adjust your computational frame. So even in larger computational contexts, this is something you correct for for free and it's already pretty small. So it's just, yes, another thing to calibrate. Okay, so I'm being pushed to ask people to ask their questions. So Benjamin Wilhelm has a question. Maybe I ask him to ask his question in person. Yeah. You want um, to be unmuted? 
Hi, it's actually Pavel. Ben's here with me. <laughs> We're listening together. So yeah, um, thanks. I was just really interested in how the calibration works in terms of preparing yourself for these uh, randomized benchmarking measurements. So uh, in particular, how closely you basically need to tune all your parameters to achieve these fidelities. So kind of in terms of, especially when you look at coherent errors building up um, in longer gate sequences. So you mean, how do we calibrate the gates specifically for doing randomized benchmarking? Yeah, or maybe in, you know, when you're really going to push for the like best fidelity measurements, like how close do you essentially need to have like your frequency and power set and essentially to be able to achieve this fidelity essentially? Um, so for the two qubit gate, we don't really do anything special to calibrate specifically for randomized benchmarking as opposed to for one gate. So we find that doing two loops um, without Wolf modulation, you can tune up the gate parameters well enough to get a decent fidelity in randomized benchmarking sequences, at least for the length that we measured. Um, one thing that we did do though is obviously if you're doing randomized benchmarking, you have not only two qubit gates, but also single qubit gates are important. And um, to measure a good sequence fidelity, your single qubit gates will also need to be well calibrated. So we did actually calibrate the single qubit gates um, by doing randomized benchmarking sequences and looking at what the best fidelity after, say, however many thousands of single qubit gates was. Mm -hmm. And if I remember correctly, your single qubit gates are both performed by the RF fields? Yes, so we have um, okay. a 2.8 gigahertz calcium and 400 megahertz mm -hmm. RF drive. Okay. So, so to add some numbers onto that, uh, what's really nice about these gates is that the physics is very simple and your parameters are pretty orthogonal once you're very close to tuned up. So we need to set the power to a level of about a percent to get the contribution from that to be of order 10 to the minus four. And we need to set the detuning to uh, maybe uh, three or four percent since we're fourth order, only fourth order sensitive to that rather than second order sensitive to that because of the composite pulse sequences we're doing. Mm -hmm. So what we actually found in this system is that the single qubit gates are implemented in a very sloppy fashion, since mm -hmm. we never thought we'd be limited by single qubit gates in the system. So we have some rather nasty amplifiers running off rather poor power supplies, which are rather unstable. So one of the main annoyances with actually taking this data that we didn't quite end up fixing before we uh, ran out of the time we wanted to spend on these experiments was fluctuations in the single qubit gate Rabi frequencies. So we actually think that for a lot of our randomized benchmarking data, the limit on the stability and how reliably we could understand what was going on was in fact boring variations in the single qubit benchmarking rather than on the two qubit benchmarking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. So the single qubits were, the single qubit gates were uglier than we, we can do a lot better. We can get down to 10 to the minus six like this if we try, but we used a very poor amplifier chain that was working not very well and we never quite put enough effort into fixing it because by the time we'd taken the data and finally analyzed it, it took us a while to work out what was really limiting us on this. Okay. And I guess one more question, if I may, really quickly. So going from like a light shift gate on two of the same species and going to uh, multi, you know, different species, what was kind of the hardest thing to kind of control or like what was the biggest problem or challenge that came up from switching to a different species? I mean, besides, you know, more power and, you know, everything else. Well, there were a few issues, weren't there? <laughs> um, I mean, one, one, one thing is needing a lot more laser power because the, uh, the detuning from the electric dipole transitions in calcium strontium here is um, uh, a few times higher. So sort of going up from maybe uh, five milliwatts in each of those Ramon laser beams to 50 milliwatts. So that required a, a much higher power laser system, which has its own technical complications. So it was a Thai sapphire based laser system, mm -hmm. frequency double. Um, I guess there were these mysterious issues with uh, what we call in untrapping the compensation voltages, that is stray electric fields mm -hmm. in the trap, which um, we don't fully understand in the system. We tried to sort of sneak that by the referees in this paper, but unfortunately they were sharp enough and picked us up on this. So, uh, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's some uh, description of that in the paper, but we don't, I wouldn't say we fully understand uh, what's going on there, but well, my co-authors will Correct me if uh, if I'm wrong there. But that that was one of the turned out to be one of the limiting sort of uncertainties or contributions to the error budget in this case. 
Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things. So what's what I think really nice about this gate mechanism is that you can apply exactly the same gate mechanism to two calcium qubits or to a calcium qubit and a strontium qubit and essentially not really have to change any of the parameters. So what this means is once we get it working nicely on two calcium ions, we can just swap to a one calcium and one strontium, for example, and it works just as well. And I, I'd say we've been very pleasantly surprised by just how robust it is because the physics is very clean and simple. So all the complexities David was just talking about there and all the complexities we've been fighting about are the standard complexities of working with multiple laser species where you double the number of lasers, which more than doubles the complexity of the experiments. And you become more sensitive to various parameters because of breaking all the lovely symmetries you didn't realize you relied on so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just to add to that, uh, for us, ahead, really the, um, the one main thing was really like these compensation issues. Um, when, when we first performed the gate um, with calcium strontium compared to um, calcium calcium and had a good calcium calcium gate the fidelity was already fairly high apart from some issues we have with the b field that were unrelated um we are much much more sensitive to the gate compensation than we anticipated and um, we have found a little bit more about that recently um in that we apply the rf that we use to do single qubit rotations on the grounded blades and we saw that um depending on whether we have them connected or not, um, our radial mode heating rate increases a lot by 300 quanta per second. Um, so we think that the reason why we are so sensitive to this compensation might actually be related to that. Um, we're still investigating this a bit more carefully, but that was really the main um, improvement in terms of gate, apart from just having twice the lasers to keep working at the same time. But I guess there are some qualitative differences in the physics going from same species to dual species on the very in, in, in so the radial um, radial confinement in the trap is different then because the ions have different masses the pseudo potential confinement yeah. is and that's something that you just don't have at all for for same species so when you get down into issues like detailed issues of things like coupling between the axial modes um, along the z directions as uh, Amy had it in the side and the radial modes the x and y um, motions, they will just be qualitatively different um, in the mixed species case. Yeah, so with calcium strontium, the radial mode structure is a bit inconvenient, um, and we had to adjust our um, axial confinement a little bit um, to not get killed by cross coupling. Um, of course, if you have a really high read heating rate, the problem with mixed species is also that you, your out of phase mode now doesn't have a zero heating rate anymore. Um, but it's also affected by heating somewhat. Um, and similarly, in the in-phase mode, you're also a bit affected by co-cross coupling. So you have to be a bit more careful about where your radial modes are situated and um, that they're cooled sufficiently. How big is the heating rate now that you get? Um, for a single iron, um, we get about 100 quanta per second. For the mixed species? And then, is it um, so mixed species um, in the in-phase mode, um, about 120 quanta per second in the outer phase mode um, between 8 and 30 quanta per second. Again, we think that deviation that what we measured was um, due to this compensation issues and that we were coupling a bit to the radial modes. Okay, thank you. So for the non-experts, that's a huge heating rate right there. There's, a, <laughs> there's some suspicious technical noise uh, problems in this particular trap. But, uh, uh, that's, uh, yeah, so for same species crystal, our outer phase heating rate is below one quanta per second, but just for mixed species, we didn't start to see something funny. Mm -hmm. Good, there's a question from Alessandro Villa, so maybe uh, it's quite a nice general one to open up a further discussion. Alessandro? Yeah, <clears throat> so is that another question about general direction. Uh, so when you want to talk about this fault, uh, or fault uh, tolerance and error correction, um, I mean, how much, how much better do you need to go and uh, how much can you go now, you think? What's the next step on this extension? That's a really good question. It depends a lot about what thing you're aiming for. So what's really interesting about quantum computing right now as a general field is that there's quite a few different approaches that are opening up. So with superconducting devices, you can have somewhat poorly connected meshes of qubits and it's clear, you know, Google already have 50 qubit devices Rigetti will sell you access to a 128 qubit device, but where the qubits are very poorly connected. 
Uh, so you can go down that route, or you can go down the ARM devices, which tend to offer very good connectivity and low errors. Then the question you have to be is how many qubits you need and how low do your errors need to be? And exactly which direction that works best for your application depends a lot on all of these details. So if you, for example, the standard approach to variational quantum circuits relies on having very shallow circuits since people anticipate having large errors. And these quite naturally map on the certain types of superconducting architectures. But there's also very interesting variational approaches you can take by using deeper circuits and having to do less work on the variational hybrid classical side and more work on the quantum computer, which potentially look much more interesting than standard variation algorithms for this. So really, uh, it depends on your application. If in particular, if you want to go towards error correction, which is I think where we, as physicists, all would really love to get to, uh, to the point where we don't need to worry about errors anymore in our computations, this uh, essentially requires errors that are as good as possible, since by the time you start getting it always ends up looking better to reduce the physical errors in your gates because the exponent you need in terms of uh, ancilla qubits as you scale up your error correction looks so terrifying that it really pays a very good return on investment to get your physical gates better. So as to where we think we can get to, we're pretty confident on these small systems we know how to get to about another order of magnitude improvement. So perhaps getting down to a few 10 to the minus four you know, we have apparatus in the lab where we think could get to that if we really, really pushed and, you know, pull all the stops out. Uh, but also we think the nice thing about ions is we know the physics to about, you know, 18 decimal places. We really understand exactly what's going on. And we think that especially getting rid of lasers and using integrated electronic control, we think we know how to get down to <clears throat> another order of magnitude or two below that. So we think we know based on error budgets and uh, lots of crossed fingers and toes, how to perhaps get down to 10 to the minus five level physical two qubit gate errors with electronic control and trapped ions. And as to exactly where you need to get to, this, this very much depends on application. For near-term applications, if you can build 100 qubits with 99.9% .9 connective fidelity, you're really going to be a very happy man. But to do error correction, 99.9% .9 doesn't really cut the mustard unless you can scale up to very large devices very, very easily. And you really want to improve your, your gate quality beyond that. How, how far are you in the single qubit rotations in the fidelity now? Uh, the single qubit rotations, uh, if we try, we can get them perfect. So with uh, laser gates, uh, we can do 10 to the minus five, uh, a few 10 to the minus five without a sweat, just by dialing things in. With the electronic control, with microwave control, we have demonstrated low 10 to the minus sixes to high 10 to the minus sevens, depending on exactly how you measure that. Um, and again, the limitation there is nothing in particular, it's just you know, amplitude stability and electronic control and calibration stability. Mm -hmm. So the limitation really is in the two qubit gates and all of the ancilla stuff that happens around the two qubit gates. And in particular with trapped ions, we have these heating problems and a lot of work is going on kind of under the surface on how to try and solve these and how to manage the temperature of your ions throughout arbitrarily long computations. So maybe I can ask a question at that point because I think it's relevant, but the, one of the bottlenecks it seems to me in trying to push the fidelities is just the calibration time. Uh, and in particular, the mixed species gates have these extra degrees of freedom. Uh, and if you start to think of calibrating that over a larger device, it looks quite uh, daunting. So do you have comments on that, uh, Derek? Yes, I completely agree. Um, it, it's really a, a lot of work at the moment that goes into, well, but one of our main motivations for this gate was precisely reducing the number of lasers we have involved, um, making the physics as symmetric as possible, which reduces the calibration parameters on the hunch that this would allow us to improve the fidelity. And indeed, it did allow us to improve the fidelity. We've in fact tried a few different gate mechanisms like this uh, with more or less asymmetry, and you know, found that these light shift type gates with fewer parameters to calibrate really do give higher fidelities for no other reason than there's just fewer, fewer knobs you have to adjust simultaneously to keep the devices working. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things we get for free in ions that we often overlook is that we don't calibrate qubits, we calibrate interactions. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine a trap with say one interaction zone and an arbitrary number of qubits, and you can just shuttle the qubits around into that interaction zone. And once you calibrate the interactions in that interaction zone, 
uh, you can put as many qubits as you want in with just a linear slowdown. And I think a lot of the work that we need to do as a field is to get the engineering better. So A, we don't calibrate things that are just down to drift that shouldn't be drifting. We instead just fix the drift. And B, work on transport to try and get to the point where we're not trying to calibrate interactions all over the place when we can just calibrate interaction to, into a few smaller subsets of regions and then move the ions around into those interaction regions. Another thing, of course, that helps with the calibrations is being able to do things faster. So, um, uh, in fact, you know, Vera's um, uh, earlier work on in improve, increasing the two cubic gate speed, uh, so you know, if you increase the gate speed and your measurement speed and all these things, then you can do these calibrations faster. Um, and uh, uh, and then, you know, beat whatever drifts you have as well, but then just get the calibrations all done uh, more rapidly. I would also like to add that the calibrations to that experiment actually weren't that bad um, in the sense that um, the drifts that we saw from day to day were quite small and um, all can be calibrated automatically. So um, once you set it up once and they were actually quite stable and like coming in on the next day, um, it didn't change much apart from the typical known errors that are automatically calibrated. So just to put this in perspective, maybe, uh, for example, for the uh, randomness benchmarking and case tomography um, experiments, this was like 10 hours of data or something without a single uh, recalibration of the gate parameters in between. The only thing I think in that instance we recalibrated were just uh, B-field uh, offsets. So maybe I'll just stop sharing my screen now. We can move to a discussion. Uh, your screen might still be useful if there are other slides, but uh, I think the discussion, we have to finish at three, so I think we only have another seven minutes, as I understand things. So I would say let's just continue the discussion. So uh, I see a question from uh, Benjamin Wilhelm again, which might be from somebody sitting next to him, but maybe you want to ask that. This may have just partially been answered by Chris. But... Well, maybe I asked it. So it sounds like uh, you also tried other types of gates. So the question was, did you try and perform a Malma Sorensen type gate using the Raman beams for comparison? And it sounded like you did. What was the fidelity for that? Yeah. Yes, so that's what we're working on at the moment. Um, so what we're trying at the moment is just investigating different gate mechanisms using different lasers, um, all of the different combinations, different qubits that we can try and seeing which one comes out on top. Um, so it's still a work in progress. I wouldn't put a final number on it yet. Um, but we have done a Malmö Sorensen gate on calcium strontium, both with the um, Raman lasers driving both qubits and also with the Raman lasers on calcium, but a 674 nanometer laser on strontium. Um, and so far, the light shift gate has performed better than all of them. But the Malmö Sorensen gate with just the Raman lasers um, same lasers for both qubits. Um, as I say, it is a work in progress, but it is going well. I think we're now above 99%. Maybe Vera has the latest number. Yeah, so um, as of yesterday, um, the non readout normalized fidelity is sometimes 99%. Um, our biggest problems at the moment are drifts, um, mostly due to um, magnetic field drifts. Um, a, because um, this is a mixed species gate, we can't use a clock qubit for both qubits. And this might actually be slightly annoying because we get the um, different um, field drift induced shifts on calcium and on strontium. Um, and B, because we use the same moment, overlap a lot of beams, so we lose a lot of power, we can only go very slow. Um, so at the moment, um, the two loop gate takes 120 microseconds and we see um, some considerable errors from that. Um, we also have some other errors that seem to drift, but it, we repeatedly measured 99% fidelity, but we also repeatedly measured 95% fidelity. <laughs> so <laughs> we're working on it. Yeah, the, the, the best number there, Vera, would be about the same with them. Uh, after you've done the readout, taking into account readout normalization would be about the same then as the uh, um, uh, present work we're discussing. Yes. So yeah, if, if you do read that normalization on that, it will be roughly 99.7-ish. Um, yeah. 
And these B field drifts are from the, the field that you're creating or these external fields that are some offsets just from? Um, so that them? is, those are external drifts. Um, so we have a, like an active stabilization on the current, but those fluctuations are on a much smaller level. So, um, so we have like a B field server running, but if you take enough data, it takes quite some time. And I can see if the B field changes, um, in, in the servo afterwards, I can correlate it to the angle and the parity and I can see some correlation in the fidelity there. Um, and we, like if we intentionally make the B field worse, it also gets worse. So I think at least considerable part of the error comes from that, but it's really work on progress and there might be other things going on at the moment. That's just our current theory. So specifically on that, this experiment wasn't designed to work with these kind of very magnetically sensitive qubits. So it doesn't have any magnetic field shielding built in. So if someone takes a lift in the building that's only uh, maybe five or six meters away through the wall, uh, we see changes in the magnetically sensitive cuba frequencies. So we have uh, calibrations that take this out, but we can improve this by three or four orders of magnitude by adding magnetic shield. We just didn't when we designed this experiment. We also see shifts if we move the chairs in the lab about because they have a nice little big metal stick in there. So you have to sit very quietly. Uh, when you take data. Mm, thank you. Good, we have two minutes left. I don't know uh, if the uh, editors want to take over and close us up or? Yeah, we are, we are getting close to 3 p.m. and uh, for you, right? And I mean, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So um, could you please stop sharing the slide, Amy? I just want to show a final slide and then we can close our meeting. So I just want to tell you very briefly that uh, the next uh, journal club uh, is going to be uh, on uh, Wednesday, next Wednesday. And uh, we would like to let you know the number, the name of the papers, this one that you're seeing is uh, two qubit spectroscopy of spatial temporally correlated quantum noise and superconducting qubits uh, by the Oliver Group in MIT and collaborators. And uh, this is one of the first papers published uh, in physical review in PRX Cube Quantum. So I hope to see you there and uh, thank you all. Thank you, Amy, especially for the nice talk. And I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone for coming. Bye-bye.